Welcome to today's topic, randomized trials. We'll do a quick recap to set the stage, introduce the randomized control trial, or RCT, then talk about some examples. What is the definition of an RCT? It is a study design that randomly assigns participants into an experimental group or a control group. As the study is conducted, the only expected difference between the control and experimental groups in an RCT, or randomized control trial, is the outcome variable being studied. For example, an outcome like the number of individuals who quit smoking in a smoking cessation trial. Why are RCTs the gold standard for scientific evidence and health policy in program evaluation? Well, remember that pesky counterfactual concept we talked about? To remind you, the counterfactual is an estimate of what the outcome would have been for a program participant in the absence of the program. And remember, to identify the causal effect, we have to consider two states of the world. First, what happens with the program or policy, that is, the intervention, or what happens without the program or policy, that's the counterfactual. The difference between number one and number two is the causal effect that we're after. RCTs are the best way to establish the counterfactual. And as you remember, evaluation is all about the counterfactual. But why do we have to randomize? Bear with me here, this is a mouthful. It is because it is only possible for us to know that one intervention is more or less effective than an alternative if we can compare groups that are equal in all known and unknown variables that relate to the outcome before each of these groups receives the experimental or the control intervention. Whew, okay, what's a shorter way of saying that? A shorter way of saying that is we have to avoid selection bias and confounding. Maybe an example will help. Say you wanna test whether a physical fitness exercise program for the elderly reduces heart attacks. How would you assign individuals to the intervention and the control? Can we just offer the program to everyone and then look at the differences before and after between those who use the program and those who don't? The short answer is no. Why? Because of selection bias causing confounding. In this case, it is very likely that individuals who enroll in or use the program have other characteristics that make them prone to having better outcomes. Can you think of any? How about Motivation. It takes motivation to sign up for the exercise program, and it takes motivation to exercise and do other healthful activities. So those individuals who may be more motivated, and so eat healthier and exercise more and do all those other things, are the ones who are likely to choose the program. Or take another example, adherence. Those same individuals who are more likely to sign up for the program and do the exercise may be more likely to take their prescribed medications. Or time. Maybe those that have time to do the program or to sign up for it have time for other health-driven activities. Okay, I think you get the picture. So instead, if we randomize who gets the exercise program, we can get a valid comparison group and therefore a valid counterfactual. Okay, one last point to leave you with. To do randomization of individuals, you must satisfy the principle of equipoise. Equipoise holds that an individual may be enrolled ethically into a randomized control trial or RCT only when substantial uncertainty surrounds which of the trial treatments would most likely benefit that individual. So you can't randomize individuals if you know one treatment or policy is definitively better than the other. For example, it would violate the principle of equipoise to randomize individuals to access to healthcare versus not to measure changes in health outcomes, spending, really any outcome. Do you think the exercise program example, the one for the elderly, violates the principle of equipoise? Well, it could if we feel that the benefit is so great from the exercise program that it would be unethical to not give it to people. But perhaps in reality, Participants in the exercise program may sustain injuries, or control participants may be doing other activities such that the additive effect is not really that significant. These are the types of considerations that could lead this trial to have clinical equipoise. Okay, 
So today we introduced the randomized trial, we reviewed the concept of the counterfactual and how randomization helps establish it. We also discussed how randomization minimizes selection bias and confounding. Lastly, we discussed the principle of equipoise. See you next time.